Good day grade 12s, my name is Viola from the Distinction Bound Student. I'd like to welcome you to Lesson 86 from the Distinction Bound Student Textbook written by Cardin Madzokir. This is the fourth lesson for Term 3 under the topic, Economic Growth and Development. The previous lesson was an essay-type question and also this one is an essay-type question as well. Remember we have 25 possible essays and they are all listed in this book from page 396 to page 398. If you want to purchase the book I'm using in this video, call us on 0738840877 or email us at thedistinctionboundstudent at gmail.com. Our complete versions cost 250 rand while our no answers versions cost 200 rands. Please comment, like and subscribe to our channel. Also hit the notification bell for you to get notified on new videos when we post. We are working so hard to ensure that you get distinctions. I applaud Cardin for starting this institution. We ask for your support to help us grow. Without further ado, let's dive into today's lesson. As usual, we will start off with our homework activity 76 given in lesson 85 linked down below. Question 1. Define the concept progressive income tax system. 2 marks. Well, a progressive income tax system is that which charges high-income earners more tax than low-income earners. Remember it is the tax system used here in South Africa and obviously in many parts of the world. The opposite of this system is called a regressive income tax system, which obviously means charging low-income earners more tax than high-income earners. It imposes a greater burden on the poor than on the rich. Which tax system do you think is better between these two? Put your response in the comment section down below. In 2005, the Swiss canton of Obwalden implemented a regressive tax system. It was struck down by the Federal Supreme Court of Switzerland in 2007 because it ran counter to the Swiss federal constitution. Question 2. Why does the South African government use this tax system? Obviously they do it to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. Another reason would be to redistribute income, which obviously take us back to the first point. Let's now look at lesson 86. Our topic is evaluating the approaches used in South Africa. Quick reminder, this is a possible essay. South Africa's growth policies include the following. GEAR, SJISA, NGP, and its development policies include RDP, BEE, GYPSA, NDP, NSDS, to name just a few. In a country, economic development is given priority, that means development comes first and growth follows. That sounds contradictory to what we mentioned in previous videos. Jaden, please clarify. Hi everyone. Well, I think you say contradictory because in the past you mentioned that South Africa has economic growth as a macroeconomic objective and not economic development. Growth leads to development. So one way or the other, when the government implements growth policies, those policies will indirectly stimulate development. Development policies don't always influence economic growth. I hope I answered well. I'm sure I agree with you because look at what the South African government did soon after independence in 1994. The first policy they introduced was what, RDP, which happens to be an economic development policy to empower people. And remember in previous lessons. In fact to be more accurate, lesson 83. In that lesson we explained that growth has to do with things and development has to do with people. An economic growth policy later followed in 1996 in form of gear, with the assumption that satisfied citizens with a better standard of living would be more likely to be productive and increase the production capacity of our country. Now let's individually look at these growth and development policies before comparing them with international benchmarks and lastly making an evaluation on these policies. The first policy that we will look at is RDP, which in full stands for the Reconstruction and Development Program. Many people think RDP is a house. Do you also think it's a house? Let's find out. I'll give this portion of the lesson to Caden. Don't confuse Caden for Cardin. Over to you Caden. Good day grade 12s. I'm excited to deliver this portion of the lesson. I'll do my best to make you understand. That's the challenge we face in our teaching field. You may understand a concept as a teacher but making learners understand is where the challenge is. RDP, as Viola has already stated, stands for Reconstruction and Development Policy. It was clear from the implementation of this policy that people were government's target. I'm saying so because the name of the policy has the term development in it. The government was not even sneaky about it. 
their main focus was on the citizens. Remember president at that time was Nelson Mandela and this policy was implemented the year he became president. RDP is a socio-economic policy framework implemented in 1994 to address problems such as poverty alleviation and the shortcomings in the provision of services across the country. RDP aims at creating a dynamic economy that can create employment opportunities, alleviating poverty, addressing inequality, meeting basic needs, addressing structural problems in the economy that limit growth, expanding the export potential of South Africa. The program contained both demand and supply side strategies. RDP has been part of the national budget and not a standalone program since 1996. Like what Viola said, RDP is not a house. The policy covers housing, the supply of clean water, electrification, land reform, healthcare, and public works. Between 1994 and 2001, over 1.1 million houses were built and that accommodated 5 million citizens. By the year 2000, a total of 236 projects had supplied clean piped water to nearly 4.9 million people. By 1999, some 39,000 families had been settled on 3,550 square kilometers of land. Between 1994 and 2000, around 1.75 million homes had been connected to the national grid, while the proportion of rural homes with electricity grew from 12% to 42%. Around 500 new clinics gave an additional 5 million people access to primary healthcare facilities. A community-based public works program provided employment over five years to 240,000 people on road building schemes and the installation of sewage, sanitation facilities and water supplies. The next policy I will talk about is GEAR. GEAR stands for Growth, Employment and Redistribution Program. GEAR is a macroeconomic policy implemented in 1996 to rebuild and restructure the economy in keeping with goals set in the RDP policy. Now let's move on to BEE. BEE as we all know stands for Black Economic Empowerment. It provides for the transformation of the South African economy. It ensures that black people can own, manage and control the country's economy so that the inequalities of the past can be reduced. The policy provides for the following. Social responsibility, equity ownership, that is ownership of businesses, money spent to empower disadvantaged groups, preferential procurement or tendering, management and control, in which we look at the proportion of black people as directors or board members of companies, employment equity, that is gender and demographic representation and lastly development of enterprises. In this case, development for black-owned companies. As you can see, this policy was implemented as a redress policy. As Cardin and Viola always say, redress means correcting imbalances of the past. The next policy is ASGISA. It stands for Accelerated and Shared Growth Initiative for South Africa. This is a program implemented in 2006 to address the country's chronic problem areas which are unemployment and skills shortage. You would obviously expect this policy to fund education and skills development initiatives because I believe that would address the chronic problems mentioned. The main purpose of ASGISA is to achieve economic development through economic growth. We move on to Triple BEE or Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment. Triple BEE was created to improve the distribution of income to previously disadvantaged groups. Unlike BEE, Triple BEE tries to correct imbalances on previously disadvantaged individuals and not just black people. Previously disadvantaged individuals means people who were previously disadvantaged by unfair discrimination. Yes black people were previously disadvantaged, but not just them. Broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Act 53 of 2003 provides the legal basis for the transformation of South African economy. The speed and extent of empowerment and transformation were agreed upon in terms of so-called charters between government and various industries. Now let's look at small, medium and micro enterprises. In 2012 a new agency called Small Enterprise Finance Agency was formed, and would have access to 1.4 billion rands in the funding of small, medium and micro enterprises in South Africa. You can imagine what effect that would have on the growth of our economy. The agency would then be steered by the Industrial Development Corporation. 
CEFA, the agency, would focus on providing loans up to 3 million rands to small businesses. The next policy I'll talk about is NGP. It stands for New Growth Path. This policy was introduced in 2011 to accelerate growth and employment. It focuses on job creation and sector-based actions that would help this. Do you think NGP is a growth or development policy? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Also be kind enough to like this video and to subscribe to our channel. Also click the notification bell to get notified each time we post. I'll move on to GIPSA, which stands for Joint Initiative on Priority Skills Acquisition. I guess it's partially self-explanatory. In an exam you could get it correct under multiple choice or column A and B. This policy is the skills empowerment arm of the Accelerated and Shared Growth Initiative for South Africa or ASGISA. The initiative was launched in 2006 to address the country's chronic problem of unemployment and skills shortage. At this point, you might be asking yourself, if this is what Joint Initiative on Priority Acquisition is all about. Then how is it different from Accelerated and Shared Growth Initiative for South Africa? To remove the confusion, please note that GIPSA is a component of ASGISA. We have two more policies to look at before I hand back the lesson to Viola. I'll now talk about NSDS which stands for National Skills Development Strategy. The policy provides a framework for skills development in the workplace. Last but not least, I'll talk about EPWP or in full, Expanded Public Works Program. The Expanded Public Works Program is a nationwide government intervention to create employment using labor-intensive methods, and to give people the skills they can use to find jobs when their work in the EPWP is done. Over to you Viola. Thanks Caden. We will now compare the South African growth policies with those of international benchmarks. I'll cover four topics here namely exchange rate stability, economic growth, employment and lastly inflation. Let's start off with exchange rates. Kayleen, please define exchange rates for us. An exchange rate is the rate at which one currency can be traded for another. For example, exchanging rands to pounds or dollars to euro and so on. That's awesome Kayleen. The South African rand depreciated considerably between 1994 and 2002 and from 2005 it began to go up. Lately our currency is struggling to keep up with major currencies. International reserves increased from 3% of GDP in 1994 to 18.7% in 2005. The SARB switched from managed floating to free floating exchange rate system. Kayleen, what's the difference between the two? A free floating or fluctuating exchange rate system is an exchange rate system in which a currency's value is allowed to fluctuate according to demand and supply forces in a foreign exchange market while a managed floating exchange rate system is a system in which exchange rates fluctuate from day to day, but central banks attempt to influence their country's currencies by buying and selling. Thanks Kayleen, and to add, when a central bank buys its own currency, it will be an attempt to increase demand for its own currency which then causes it to appreciate. You can learn more about this in Lesson 44 of the Distinction Bound Student Textbook written by Cardin. The next benchmark I'll look at is economic growth. South Africa is a developing country where a 3% growth rate is acceptable. The government abandoned anticyclical demand management in favor of structural reform in 1996 as a guiding principle in fiscal policy. After implementing GEAR in 1996, the budget deficit reduced to less than 3% of GDP and it's acceptable as benchmark, in line with international best practice. Over to the next benchmark which is employment. Employment in the non-agricultural sector of the economy decreased. The GEAR strategy suggested that a climate was needed that was conducive to employment creation in the private sector. The private sector needs to be more efficient to compete internationally. Labor productivity in the formal economy increased by 4.2% per year over the 10-year period until 2005. The last benchmark that we will look at before moving on to the last segment of our lesson is inflation. Aiden, what is inflation? Inflation is a continuous and considerable increase in prices in general over a period of time. I like your definition Aiden because it has four key words and they are continuous, considerable, increase in general. We will explore inflation and this definition in more depth in Lesson 99. I'll link the lesson down below.
The inflation rate in South Africa averaged 9.4% from 1968 to 2014. I'd say that's not very bad. What do you think? Remember Zimbabwe hit a world record of 79.6 billion percent in mid-November 2008. Cardin likes to call hyperinflation diarrhea inflation. Prices go up more frequently than usual due to hyperinflation, which is exactly what happens when a person has diarrhea. You feel like sitting down again soon after flushing right? I guess it sounds familiar. Please don't call it diarrhea inflation in the exam. You will definitely lose marks. Anyways, the South African Reserve Bank dropped monetary targets and adopted inflation targets in a 3-6% range. Interest rates, which are based on the repo rate, are the main instrument used in the stabilization policy. We will explore this and other methods in more depth in Lesson 103. We will also link it down below once we finish making the video. In the meantime, go to page 221 and read. Just in case we haven't made the video yet. The consistently stable budget deficit also had a stabilizing effect on the inflation rate. This brings us to the end of this segment of our lesson. Let's now move on to the evaluation of the South African development approach. I'll give this portion to Jaden. Over to you Jay. Thank you Viola. In my evaluation, I'll start with growth policies, in which I'll cover economic growth, inflation, employment and exchange rate stability. Take note, these are macroeconomic objectives. Remember our macroeconomic objectives are economic growth, full employment, economic equity, price stability, and exchange rate stability. So we want to evaluate those policies that Caden explained earlier in this lesson and I'll base my evaluation on how the policies influenced growth and development in this country. I hope I'm not confusing anyone. Let's start with economic growth. South Africa is a developing country. In terms of the World Bank, it is a lower middle income country. So we still have a long way to go. Yes, our policies has influenced growth, but more needs to be done. With regards to inflation, it has been well managed in this country because an average inflation rate of 9.4% is not bad after all. Inflation was worse prior to these policies being implemented with the highest average being 18.7% in 1986. After 1994, the highest average was recorded in 2008 at 11.5%. Remember 2008 was a world financial crisis but still for South Africa it was actually better than any average between 1974 and 1992. Let's now look at employment. Year-on-year -year changes in employment as of May 5, 2014 shows stable employment growth since the first quarter of 2011 with the largest increase realized in the second quarter of 2013 where 653,000 people gained employment. The employment growth in the fourth quarter of 2012 was 256,000 jobs lower than the growth in the third quarter of 2012, however, the pace of growth started to accelerate thereafter. When it comes to exchange rate stability, the South African currency has fluctuated considerably over the past two decades. Lately, it's been losing its value against major currencies. Now we will look at development policies in which we will look at macroeconomic policy, microeconomic policy, social policy, redress, and finally land redistribution and restitution. The successful implementation of macroeconomic policies is important for both the rich and the poor. There is an almost consistent increase in per capita GNI that amounted on average to 3.1% per year over decades until 2011. With regards to microeconomic policy, due to the increase in unemployment rate, a percentage prevails that the labor market within the parameters imposed by employment equity and BEE has failed. Disappointing growth of employment was experienced over the 2002 to 2011 decade. With regards to social policy, almost 26.2% of the South African population is absolutely poor in terms of the international benchmark poverty line income of $1.90 per day. Take note, it's no longer $1.25 due to inflation, obviously. On redress, international organizations such as the United Nations articulate the importance of the empowerment of the indigenous people of a developing country. Finally, we evaluate land redistribution and restitution. The government aims to redistribute 30% of agricultural land to previously disadvantaged individuals and groups. 
By 2010, some 12.1% of agricultural land had been redistributed and some 95.4% of claims for land restitution had been finalized. This brings us to the end of the lesson. I'll hand the lesson back to Viola to give you today's homework. Over to Viola. Thanks, Jaden. Here is today's homework. Question 1. What is fronting? Two marks. Question 2. How does the government assist black-owned firms to improve their core competitiveness? For marks. Question 3. Does the South African policy on BEE conform to international best practice? Substantiate your answer. Three marks. This brings us to the end of our lesson. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Also hit the notification bell for you to get notified every time we post new content to our channel. We are also giving away the distinction-bound student t-shirts to people who buy more than 10 books. At the moment we have the following textbooks, Economics Grade 10, 11 and 12 plus Business Studies Grades 11 and 12. We are looking forward to adding more books to our catalog. Remember our books come in two versions, complete and no answers versions. Complete versions have answers and no answers versions do not. Thank you so much for your support. See you in the next video. God bless. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our